and ask any question about holiness, we'll have the guts to answer it. All right? That works for you guys? Uh-oh. Any question y'all ask, we'll answer. All right? Cool. So we're going to start uh, on this side. You could just introduce yourself. Just share a little bit about your heart uh, for holiness, and then we're going to jump into the conversation. Praise the Lord. And while we do that, if I get a tech person just to set a microphone up on the side for us, thanks. Praise the Lord. Are we excited? Yes. I am. Uh, this is a topic I enjoy most because that's where we make it real. Praise God. So we're talking about holiness today. We hope you come up with questions. And uh, I'm Mrs. Sude, uh, Dr. Day's wife. <laughs> Praise God. So we are going to be, my idea of uh, holiness is um, your lifestyle in the secret. That's a simple way I show it. I say it. What happens to you when no one is watching? What happens in your heart? What you do? That's holiness. We all have biblical dis uh, definitions for it. We have many verses to quote, but I like to make it real. So if there's any opportunity, I'll come in. I'll really make it very practical. This is not a place where you don't really have to hide anything. If you hear the part of the workshop today is overcoming sexual immorality and sexual perversion. And uh, I will key in on the sexual perversion because um, it's like an epidemic. And it's going on and hopefully we'll come in from the solution end and how we can work together as a team. One thing you need to know is that the person that God uses is a person that is close to him. And one thing that puts you away from God is sin. And uh, if you are a parent like me, I have one of my children I call most and send on errand. And because he is the one that is mostly around me when I'm in the kitchen, it's not because I don't want to call others. So if you want God to use you, you have to propose in your heart to be near to him. And the only way to be near to him is to follow the narrow way. And uh, God will help us today, and we hope you enjoy this section. Praise God. Y'all could do better than that. Come on now. Hello, everybody. Praise God. I'm Amanda Briggs, graduate of Bowie State University 2010. <laughs> BSU? Yeah. Um, holiness. Um, about three years ago, I gave my life to Christ uh, in 2010. Amen. And I've not, I have not went back. So um, holiness, just really a life, living a life consecrated, consecrated to God, just making that quality decision that, you know, I'm going to live for God and there's no turning back. So that's really my view on holiness, even what people don't see, even behind the doors, even in my thoughts, you know, just really being able to ex really reflect Christ, you know, in a, in a practical way. Amen. Praise God. All righty. If you got a Bible, just turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's just give you a verse to set the context. And it was uh, what uh, Ms. Uday was speaking of. And then we're going to jump on into this. I saw an usher with a microphone. It's going to be running around. It's going to be good. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and you got to say, yeah. All right. So it's talking about a house, and it says there's many things that are in a house. Some are useful, and some have no use at all. And the Bible says that people who are not set apart to God, they have no use in the house of God. And he said, if you cleanse yourself of the latter, you become a useful tool in the house of God. Um, verse 21 of, verse two, of chapter 2 says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, and useful for the master, if you could put it like right there in that aisle, that way they don't have to come all the way up. Useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Now here's the verse that they give to all of us single folk. Anybody who ain't married, this is the verse that you always hear. Flee also youthful lust. Somebody say run for your life. <laughs> By the way, if you read the Bible, lust is the only thing that God tells you to run from. Everything else he says, you're strong enough, stand, you're overcomer, your victory. When it comes to lust, he said, no, nah, run for your life. Don't, don't, don't hang around there. Don't even, don't fight. Just run. It says, flee youthful lust and pursue, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The Bible says that holiness is a highway. And what I want to highlight about that is holiness looks different 
in different environments. You might have holiness unlocked because you're in college and college has one world and when you graduate, holiness is a whole different ball game. I was just sitting down with OC in the back and OC was saying, you know, you think once you get married that holiness is no longer an issue. She's like, no, 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 no. It's very much an issue even when you get married. So no matter where you are, we're all on this highway of holiness. We all can become more like Christ. We can all grow more into his image. Amen? All right, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to start the questions. The mic is on this side here. If we could get maybe about three or four people just to line up, that way we can keep them coming. If they're quick answers, they're not, or whatever it may be. And then as you see the line kind of dwindling down, we will uh, add more people. All right, so go ahead, jump on in. Come on, my bold folks. All you scared folks, y'all could just sit and listen and hope someone asks your question, but <laughs> bold folks, just give us your name and uh, your question. Go for it. Is it on? All right. My name's Seven, and my question is, since there is no specific statement saying that there is no sex before marriage, then can you become engaged, and if it's a holy, patient, loving relationship, are you permitted to then have sex without guilt, seeing that both parties have vowed to restrain from sexual looseness? Woo! You were ready for that question. Come on, now. She got an essay. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Give it up for that question. Come on up. Good deal. All right, so I'm going to break it down in simple Stephen version. Basically, it says there's nowhere in the Bible that says there's no sex before marriage. Once we're engaged, once we're committed to each other, and we're heading towards marriage, is it all right to go there? That's what you're asking. All righty. Cool. Don't be answering the questions for us. We're the panel. Praise the Lord. I don't know the simplest version that we can read uh, this scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. That's what you have? <laughs> okay. Can we, I mean, do we have it in, what's the simplest? Can you read it, Pastor? New Living. Verse 12. Verse 12. Mm -hmm. It said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Go on. Praise God. That's a very practical question. Uh, we are sure we're going to get married in a week's time. What's the point? Um, what's the point keeping these rules? And uh, what I will say is we all have the Holy Spirit. And uh, there is no way you can put a stop to how far you can go, even from where you want to start. So I would suggest that what the Bible is saying here is that there are so many things that are not clear cut where they say don't kiss passionately before you marry, just hug, just have a peg. It's not written here. But if you have the Spirit of God in you, the Spirit of God will tell you that what you are doing is wrong or what you are doing is right. Now, if we can be very true and sincere to ourselves, what drives this question is just like we are all feeling hungry to eat. You, never, you know, if I bring you an African meal now that you have never eaten, you want to eat it. So you have to know that behind all this is the appetite and the loss to sin. And if you can learn to t put your body under, the Bible says, Paul was saying that, I, I have to learn to put my body under. That means you have to learn to say no to your body. So I clearly understand from the Bible that to you, to our generation, to the world, the definition might change. But God's definition means stay away. So premarital uh, sex is not allowed even when you are sure you are going to marry that person. And come to think of it, who is sure that by tomorrow morning you'll be alive? You're not sure. So they make the standard high so that even when you fall, you are not breaking the standard of God. So keep your standard very high. That's the best way to go. All things are lawful, but not the, all things are expedient. If it is expedient for you and you judge it through the word of God and it is expedient, do it. But it's not everything you will see. Don't do this, don't do that. But it's still here. Praise God. Anybody else would like to add? Um, if I am engaged and committed, uh, is it all right for me to have sex since there's nowhere in the Bible where it explicitly says to wait for marriage? Uh, anybody else want to add to that? My brother. <laughs> well, my, my first thought about this was, you know, how do we define fornication? Yeah. Yeah. 
um, from my understanding of scripture, fornication is sex outside of marriage. And even though we don't have the literal words, don't have sex before marriage, we do see the word fornication many places in the scriptures, and uh, they are considered evil that comes out of our heart, that it's an issue that arises from our heart, which none of us can really understand. The Bible says only God can know the evil in our heart, and a lot of times we can confuse ourselves thinking that our desire to have premarital sex is from this loving place, and we're going to get married soon, but honestly, only the Spirit of God can discern the heart, and a lot of times he'll show us that it's really from a fleshly place, and it is fornication to have sex before marriage. So. Uh, the definition of fornication, uh, it comes from the word pornos. Does that sound familiar? I'm just saying. <laughs> a man who prostitutes his, brother, his body to another's lust for hire, a male prostitute, a man who indulges in unlawful sexual intercourse. Fornication is sex outside of marriage. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 9. The Bible explicitly says, now obviously it's not written in our current vernacular, that's why it uses the word fornication, but the Bible explicitly says those who are fornicators, those who have sex outside of marriage, have an unrepented heart and they're not entering the kingdom of heaven. Does that make sense? So it, it's, 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 it's definitely vital, definitely important. All right, go ahead, brother. My name is Nate. Angie. Nate? Yeah, Angie. All right, State what up, Nate? Where you from? Right. I'm from St. Louis originally, but I'm out here from Greensboro. Okay, cool. Come on now. All right, this is my question. All right, so let's say, let's say you're witnessing and you're trying to evangelize and win people to Christ, right? <laughs> and um, you interacting with females. Now, you're not, you're not trying to come off on them. You're just trying to show them God and love and... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? This man got swag. He's like, I'm just trying to show him godly love. You know what I mean? And you just, you just, being, I feel you. you just being cool with him and you trying to witness to him and say, like, you could probably put him on some women that they could learn from, but the women don't be around like that because they be busy at the church. So when you be on campus or whatever, they be asking you questions, you be spending time with them, and they start taking that for, like, attraction and stuff. Like, how you handle the, when they start coming at you? Like, do you just leave them alone or do you keep trying to witness to them or? <laughs> Cause, <laughs> give it up for Nate. Come on. Do you guys mind if I answer that? You look. You got something. You wait. You wait. All right. Uh, where'd Nate go? I lost him. Oh, there you go. All right. This is the first thing that pops into my mind. Paul said this. Paul said, "I'm gonna watch myself so that after preaching the gospel, I don't lose my own soul." In other words, Paul was saying, my number one priority is what? Me. Me. Everybody else's salvation is secondary to mine. So it's important that you tell people about Christ. It's important that you lead people on your campus to Christ. But it's more important that you make it in. Does that make sense? So look out for your own holiness first as opposed to others. And then after that, set things in order. And the other thing that I would say is this, have proper boundaries. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How ratchet can I be? Can I be just all the way honest? Or... <laughs> Somebody say, go for it. I'm... Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your treasure is your time. A lot of times we think our treasure is our money. Our money is only a proof of where we spent our time. Wherever you invest your time is where your heart's going to go. You, you tracking with me? So if you invest your time in some ratchet chick, guess where your heart's going to go? What you got to call it that? I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? So you got to understand, hold on a sec, I'm 100% man. God made me this way. I'm a lover of God, but I also love women. So I need to watch my boundaries. No, we're not having Bible study in my dorm because I'm not that dumb. Straight up. You're going to get text messages. I'm going to get in trouble now. Text messages and phone calls. I'm about to lose my salvation if you don't come here and help me out. Well, I guess you just lost it because I ain't coming. Straight up. And this is, this is what I find also. 
if you, and this is, is vice versa, I'm just coming for the girls, but it's the same thing back and forth. If you have a female that loves God, that is, is pursuing God, give that girl her number. If she really wants God, she will track her down and connect with her. If she's just trying to make you trip up, you'll never see her again. Does that make sense? So God, at my church, we have this thing we call the Christian side hug. If she ain't my wife, she getting one of them. <laughs> Come on, now, you know what? I don't want all that. Now I'm trying. Bless God. Amen. Cool. All right, so we can have two more. I'm sorry, two more questions, and then we're gonna switch it up a little bit. Dude was like, "No, nah, my question was good. Go ahead." Um, my name is Gabriel. And, Gabriel. Um, yeah. Okay. Praise God. So my question was, um, I've learned that or was told, but I didn't completely understand that when you're facing temptation with um, certain things or whatever have you, you're supposed to let God fight for you and not fight for yourself. So I'm really trying to figure out like what, how do you let God fight for you in those situations and circumstances? What in the world does that so look like? So like outside of, I mean, cause the verse that comes to mind is first Corinthians 10, 13 with the way of escape. But at the same time, um, how do you let God fight for you in those circumstances? Okay, definitely. So you're in a moment of temptation, yeah. and you know that God's going to fight your battles for you. So right. how does, how, what does yeah, give me in practical, that moment, what does that look like? What happens? Okay, cool. Yeah. Definitely. How do I let God fight my battles for me when I'm in a moment of temptation? There's a couple of scriptures that I want to bring to point. The first one is Philippians 2 and 13. Y'all looking at me like, yeah, man, we ain't bring no Bibles. <laughs> Philippians 2 and 13. Um, now I'm going I'm to begin at verse 12. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. The reason why I wanted to highlight verse 13 is it because, it's because it talks about how God is actually working in us, giving us, first of all, the will, the desire to even do what pleases him. So when we first recognize that even our, even our obedience to the promptings and the leading of the Holy Spirit, we first give honor to God because I wouldn't even have a desire to do what's right without him. I acknowledge that, God, I, I need you to even give me a desire to please you. Secondly, God not only gives us the desire to please him, he then gives us the ability to do what pleases him. There's a beautiful marriage between God's work and our responsibility in this verse. You, you see both God working in us, giving us the desire and the ability, but you also see our responsibility to respond to the power that is at work in us. So the way we do it, it the way that I would do it, practically speaking, is whenever I tempted with sin or wherever I'm, I'm in a battle, I pray and I acknowledge, God, you said in your word that you would give me the desire and the ability to do what pleases you. God, I acknowledge that this is tough and this is something that I can't do on my own, so I'm trusting in the power of the cross. I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ that has set me free, and I'm leaning into you for strength in this moment, and I will do whatever your spirit leads me to do. So then we have this working of God's spirit in us, accomplishing what we could never accomplish on our own, but we also have a responsibility where we're acting out what the spirit of God is leading us to do. And another scripture I would reference is Ephesians 6, where it talks about being strong in the power of the Lord. And it talks about putting on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. So these are, these are great uh, scriptures that I would encourage you to read. And I think that's an appropriate prayer for us to pray in situations like that. I, I think I just want to, again, agree with um, Martez when it comes down to the word of God. I think we definitely search out um, practical steps, but we have to be careful um, why I'm just coming back to kind of stand with him about the word. Sometimes we want the practical steps, but we don't recognize that the practical steps is the word. Does that make sense? 
And, we, and it really exposes our, the lack of faith that we have in the word. We're just like, okay, I got the scripture, but what am I really supposed to do? Did anybody ever say that? Like, I got the word, but what am I really supposed to do? And what that shows is really that we think the word isn't enough. And it is enough. And, um, but we do need to develop um, a proactive strategy. Like, it doesn't make sense. Here's something I, I read. I have a, this book about um, how to deal with temptation. And it was saying, don't be alone in the person you like. Don't be alone in their room. That's just something simple. You know what I'm saying? Like, something simple, like, don't tell yourself we just chilling when you really know you're just setting yourself up. Like, you turn on the movie, but you know y'all going to make out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, you lie to yourself. Oh, we just want to read. I just want to go see him. You're lying. You understand that you know the course that you're going to take, but you tell yourself a lie so you'll feel okay walking into the room. Does that make sense? So you don't go into the person's room. If you know you struggle with um, pornography, then you need to set up boundaries. Pure eyes. Um, there's one, uh, what's another? Uh, Covenant eyes. Covenant eyes is good. Um, on your phone, Martez has one. It's called K9. It's actually free. Um, there are things that you have to buy if you want to. People who struggle with pornography or anything that has to do with your eyes, it's something called K9. And it's a free um, system that you use. But when it really comes to temptation, what you really have to recognize is that it's not necessarily the temptation that you're really struggling with more than it is the submission to the Lord. It's us submitting to God and obeying him in times. Like, there is going to be tempting times. All temptation does, it's really supposed to bring up what is in us. Does that make sense? That's why the word tells us that we're, it's not about outwardly, but we're drawn away by our own lust. It's the inward thing. And what we would prefer as believers, we don't want to see ourselves in this nasty light. We want to be clean. We want to be pure. We want to look all this way. But then when temptation comes, it really shows us really what's within us. So in actuality, we should thank God for the temptation. God, I think, y'all looking at me like, what? This girl is on some other stuff. No, because honestly, if it had not been for the temptation, how would you know that that's an issue that you deal with? You would just be walking around thinking that you don't have all of your stuff is together and the enemy's laughing at you because honestly, you're not as victorious as you're supposed to be. Does that make sense? And a lot of times what we're trying to do, all we want to do is just be free. I want to be free from this. I want to be free from this. I want to be free from this. But we need to even ask ourselves, why, what's your motive for being free? Some of the reasons we want to be free is so we can be arrogant and stuck up like we got our stuff together. When in actuality, if we allow the things that we've been tempted by to be glory to the Lord, actually, even when we deal with like temptations as far as sexual sin, what that shows the world is, yes, I go through the same thing that you go through, but there is a way. There is a way to live a life of singleness and still, yes, I still think he looks good. Yes, I, I do want to have sex, but my body is under subjection to the Holy Spirit. And I know how to live that way. So we need to get out of this religious mindset that we want to have this kind of religious conversation about, you know, I want to be free from temptation. I think the way to being free is first examining what's your motive for being free. What is your motive for being free? I want to be free because I know that I want to please God in my lifestyle. I want to please God in, in my walk. I want to please God because I know that there, we're not supposed to be, according to Romans, in bondage to slave and to, to be in bondage to sin and death. We are supposed to be in a bond servant of Christ. But as we encounter temptation, Father, give us strategy. Give me, give me the, the tools necessary so that I can walk through this temptation, that I can overcome this temptation to give you glory and not myself. Does that make sense? Amen. Hallelujah. And as she was saying, I'm going to come to your question in a second. As she, as she was saying, um, why holiness? Um, just the verse popped into my mind um, where it says, without holiness, it's impossible to see God. Just a question really quickly. How many people love God? It's not a trick question. 
<laughs> uh, it was, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I love God. How many people remember the time when the love of God first invaded your life? When you realized, hold on, he knows who I am, yet he still wants me. You, you know what I'm talking about? When you realize, like Peter said, I, I've found the purpose of life. I've found what it's all about. I, I've found what, what, what my existence is for. It's for encountering God. I'm like David saying, man, when can I go into the house of a God? When can I see him? I long for his presence. Why holiness? Holiness because I get to see more of God. I've encountered him, but I haven't encountered all of him. The Bible says that he's omnipresent, that he's omniscient, that he's infinite, that there's so much more that God desires to reveal to me. There's so much more of his love that I can encounter. Why am I not sleeping with you? Because I'm not giving up the love of God, the encounter of God. This is what you need to see. Don't see lust as temptation. See lust as a decision to reject God or to accept God. All of a sudden, it's a totally different thing, isn't it? Clicking on this website no longer is 15 minutes of pleasure. All of a sudden, it's separating me from the one person who accepts me. I'm sorry, it's just not worth that. It's just not worth that. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Last question, and we're going to flip over. Um, you kind of already answered. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's you, prophecy right there. Come and, on. You and Nikki. But just for the sake of some of the young people in here who won't ask this question on the mic, I wanted to know some practical steps to overcoming masturbation because you can say you know you can stop looking at the computer and do this and this and that but you will still be alone in your bed at night so what are some practical steps to overcoming masturbation <laughs> that's good I got a friend who got a friend who got a friend who was gonna ask this question so let me ask the question I'm not putting you on blast let me I'll give you some practical steps I'll give you my practical steps and then everybody else can comment there's obviously the practical you should have something on your computer if you have a computer, girls and guys, I'm learning, everybody, get safe eyes, get covenant eyes, put something on your computer. Don't be stupid. The Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We ain't worried about your spirit. Your spirit is born again. It's your flesh that we're concerned about. So set up the proper barriers in your life. One of the major barriers that I place in my life, and you hear me talk about this everywhere. I talked about it a little bit this morning. I have people that I'm scared of. Anybody have people that you're scared of? Pastors? parents. You know, there's certain people that if they find out that you've fallen into sin, that they'll be heartbroken and that they'll pray with you and they'll restore you. There's other people that if they find out that you've fallen into sin, they'll start digging a ditch in the backyard and, and the ditch is for you. And, and, and they're going to throw you in that ditch. It's kind of just like you have no options. I have those type of men in my life that if they find out I blew it, you, you're not going to see me around anymore. <laughs> I'm dead serious, literally, and, and, and I, I called one of them recently, and I, I literally will say, hey, check in on me. I, my life is completely exposed to you. This is what I'm struggling with. Call me. It may be every night sometimes. It may be once a week, but whatever it may be, check in on me. And I'm not talking about those persons that are going to hug you. I'm talking about those people that when your phone rings and you see their number, your heart starts beating. <laughs> <laughs> you start saying, oh, God, search my heart, search my mind. Is there anything unpleasing in you before I pick up this phone? Does, does that make sense? Be practical, be intentional about it. And what you'll do is you will develop a pattern of holiness in your life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, masturbation is a, cl clinically we can describe it. But one thing we know is that we all know that you can be, you can be a, uh, it can be an obsession. It can be a habit. It can also be an accident. When it's an accident, you have a red flag. You know when it's about to start. And that's the right time to nip it in the bud. If it becomes a habitual lifestyle, you probably, not probably, you need the deliverance from the word of God. And you cannot do it alone. We have believed so many lies. And there are lies we have believed that is attached to this sin. And you see, um, we have believed a lie that when I get married and I have sex frequently as much as I want, it will be a bygone. Lie, lie, lie. You have to understand that it's a spiritual sin. And when you understand the red flags for you, we are talking about practical, you know yourself 
The Bible said, for your sin, you know it. We all know it. You know your vulnerabilities. So you have to learn to be open. Some of us are battling with it, but we don't want so many of us to know about it. You probably might not be, uh, you probably might understand that the people you are calling to mentor, you might be people who have overcome that sin. So that's a practical step. Talk to your mentors. Talk to, seek help and make a public show of this. The Bible said that Jesus died on the cross by making a public show of the enemy, by triumphing. So there's a way when you make a public show of the devil's work in your life, that's the one step to overcome. So speak it out. Say it. It's not you. It's about your destiny. Praise God. Amen. Um, well, first off, what I thought about was, you know, in Genesis when, you know, they hid from God after they ate the fruit. And so I'm just thinking, like, you know, when I have to hide to do something, especially to, you know, satisfy myself, bring pleasure to myself, I'm just speaking generally. Um, you know, I know that I'm doing something in secrecy. I'm doing something that's hidden. And so what we know is that whatever is hidden is going to come to light. So whether somebody may not see you actually doing the act, but there will be things that will come out on you. And so um, my whole point, my whole thing is that um, a practical way is really, it's really important that you have support. Um, it's very important that you have good godly counsel because, you know, it's a lot of people who will be like, hey, you know, it's just something really little. But no, we don't need anybody that's going to compromise your relationship with Christ. So it's very important that you have the right people around you. And you have to learn how to be just transparent. You got to, just like you want to be, you know, you want to be real with yourself, you need to be able to be open so that you're not living a, a secret life of sin, but that you're able to, you know, it's able to, you're able to be bold, like, okay, yes, I did this, but it will no longer keep me bound because that's how the devil really keeps us bound a lot is with iniquity is those, those hidden things so you know I just encourage you you know it's really important that you have that support amen um we both wanted to come up uh I guess we both want to come up about this masturbation thing and just um overcoming sexual um perversion in together um just a brief thing with me and Martez. Um, we both, even before we got married, um, in our walk with the Lord, um, we struggled in areas of lust. Um, well, not just in our, not in our relationship with each other, but even individually. Before I even met Martez, um, masturbation was a struggle for myself um, because um, I didn't have sex. I struggled with my mind and my thoughts. And a lot of times when we think about masturbation, it, you ain't even got to see nothing. Like, I wasn't a really big porn person. Honey, I can close my eyes and make up my own thing in my head. You know what I'm saying? I'm serious. Y'all would be acting like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. All right. But I'm saying, like, you know, that was the issue. And a lot of times what that means is that we haven't allowed um, the Lord to reign in our mind for him to be in control of our thoughts. Especially, I told you last night about Philippians 2, um, that we should have the mind of Christ. And even Romans 7 begins to talk about that if we want to um, be carnally minded is to think on those things that are carnal, but to be spiritually minded is to think on those things of the spirit, which means the word. And I think a lot of times what we've lost the art of is meditating on the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, allowing it to be in the forefront of our mind and then saying, Lord, I want to live out this scripture today. I want to live out the scripture in my heart. I want to meditate on these scriptures that speak not only on of purity, but my identity in Christ. Amen? And, and we have to allow that to become a practical step, you know, of, of our Christian life. So uh, Martez is going to share a little bit about himself. And, uh... Yeah, again, like Nikki was saying, this is a big part of my testimony is um, overcoming pornography. Um, I was an addict. I, it wasn't just a part of my life. I was addicted. I had to. I could not go to sleep. I would skip class. Um, I was full, like, hours on the end, night after night, just hardcore. 
addicted and I did everything that I thought I knew to do. I went to the altars, I got prayed for, um, you know, just, just whatever, I, I, I read the Bible, um, I don't know, I, I did everything. I had the, I'll tell you this, I had the internet accountability on my computer, but I didn't have it on my phone, so I started going to my phone. So I got the internet accountability on my phone, it's like, dang, I can't go to my computer, can't go to my phone, I'll use somebody else's phone. It, it, was, it was that bad. The, the only, and, I, and I'll tell you how I begin to come out, because it's been a journey. I'm walking in freedom now by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is, it is a journey, it, it is a faith walk every day that I depend on the Lord Jesus Christ to keep me. I'm not holding myself up. I'm not keeping myself. But every day I've, I've set my mind with a simple devotion to the Lord. And I think that's a practical thing that a lot of us overlook. Simple devotion daily devotion if it's nothing but 15 minutes if I don't have but 15 minutes of me and God time I'm gonna get 15 minutes of me and God time every day before the battle happens before the temptation I'm gonna have some simple devotion time and I would encourage everybody to have a time of simple devotion every single day now there are some other things that I that I've also done um there's an internet program, it's called, um, gosh, what's the name of it? Setting Captives Free. Setting Captives Free, um, Setting Captives Free is a 60-day course that you can take, and it, and it has done tremendous things yeah. for me. Um, basically, what happens over time, it's, it's really about renewing our mind. The mind has to be renewed. Strongholds are established because of wrong ways of thinking. Yeah. Strong, all strongholds are not demonic. All strongholds are, are not because of you're, you're possessed or anything like that. It's because you've got a faulty way of thinking. Yeah. You, you've got a, a set way of thinking. You've got a pattern of thinking established in your mind that, okay, when I'm frustrated, I do this. Yes. Or when I'm horny, I do this. Or when I'm lonely, I do this. It's your way of thinking that has to be renewed. It has to be reprogrammed. Your soul has to be sanctified. The spirit has been born again, but the soul is continually being sanctified until the day we meet Christ face to face. And I, I want to say, even when we were um, talking about holiness earlier, I don't know if anybody answered the question, but when we talk about holiness, for a long time, um, I even went to a church that was holiness. And so you would think that it was about the clothes. You would think that it was about the actions. And actually, what I learned through study is holiness is not, there, there are two things. One, God is holy, meaning that he is significantly other. There is no one like him. There will never be another like him. That means holy, set apart. And then there is the holiness that we recognize God to be. And then there is also a personal holiness because God calls us to himself. He calls us to be holy. He's saying, be holy as I am holy. We can't do that on our own. He calls us to that place. And our journey from where we are, which is in Ephesians, it says, for you are sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. It's almost as if Martez would be God and I'm here and he calls me. You can call me, you know, Nikki. Nick, Nikki. And he's like, be holy. Be holy. And I'm looking at myself like, man, I can't do all that. You know how I struggled last week? And he just keep calling, Nikki. be holy. Be holy. As a matter of fact, even before he called Wait, be okay, even before, even before God says be holy, he says that we are holy. You are holy. And we don't understand, oh, it's time to go, five minutes. Okay, he, and, and it's just like, we don't understand. You have to show me be that. I'm holy. Glad. But he says be holy, and as we're becoming holy, this is the process of sanctification. But one of the problems that we have, we try to work at it. Like, we have to attain it through our own achievement. Your holiness is not because you just did not masturbate from 60 days. Because we can become prideful in that. We can become prideful that I haven't slipped in a year. And then we'll start to do it in ourself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're doing good for a year, and then all of a sudden it's just that one mess up, and you feel so far off from God? Pride. Yes, that far off from God is not really your fall. It's the fall of pride. Because we should ever be dependent upon the Lord. Um, one way that we wanted to, we really wanted you to write down um, settingcaptivesfree.com. Who, if anybody will be honest, who struggles with masturbation? 
Thank you. See, I love the freedom. Amen. Thank you. That's, let let that, me tell you, number I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I would say that is so necessary for you to be able yes. to just openly confess. Yes. I openly, readily yes. admit yes. that everybody up here on this panel has said it, but, and, and that's the one thing that I have the most notes about on my tablet right now. It's walking in the light. It's being honest. Proverbs 28 and 13 says, people who conceal their sins will not prosper. Yes. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Yes. It's echoed in Psalms 32 verses 1 through 5. Confession is so, so important. Secret sin is like fungus. It grows in darkness, yes. but it dies in the light. As long as you hide sin, it will continue to grow. Yes. You, can, you don't have it under wraps as long as it's a secret. Yes. You don't. Mm -hmm. It has you, and you don't realize it. You don't. You have to confess. You've got to get to the place where, God, I desire and love you so much more than I desire this sin. And I don't care how this makes me look. Yes. I want to make you look good. Yes. I want to bring you glory. Yes. I don't care about the shame. Yes. Forget that. I, I, I'm open. Yes. So I'll, I'll share with anybody my testimony because it mm -hmm. brings glory to God. Amen. So get your piece of paper out. I want to tell you, for those of you who struggle with um, masturbation, pornography, um, and if you struggle just with sexual thoughts, um, just a, a perverted mind, um, there's this site, and you get an accountability partner. They give you the accountability partner, and at the same time, you can also add a person who's your accountability partner. And it's for 60 days, and it's from free. So write this down. Um, yeah, it's yeah. oh, www.settingcaptivesfree.com. And we actually do this with a lot of our, um, the members in our ministry. If you even deal with homosexuality, um, lesbianism in those areas, LGBT, all of that, um, the, there is freedom in the word. Amen. There's freedom in Christ. Amen. But one thing that we have to come out of, and I'll just reiterate it again, is that we can't be ashamed to say that I'm broken and I'm in need of a savior. That is actually what our, the gospel is about. It is about a body of people crying out, I am in need of a savior. And we don't need a savior if we're already together. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, I think we don't have anything, but if anybody got one, any questions about anything, you can just stand up where you are. Yeah, this is the only question because we have to go. All right, my question is, let's say you struggled with masturbation pornography, and let's say that you've committed, a, I don't know, like oral sex or anal sex, right? Mm -hmm. And from my understanding, being a virgin is being pure. And mm -hmm. being a virgin, from what we have understand, uh, I guess in Sunday school or in church, is you haven't had a penis vaginal penetration. Yes. But can you honestly say you've done all those stuff I've mentioned earlier and still claim to be a virgin? Okay. And that's something that I actually heard at a conference once. Um, is that L? Yeah. That's okay. Um, actually, if you look at the purity of virgin, meaning chaste, uh, meaning never touch, then no. Of course, I would say in light of God, I, I think even when God, because what we should be more concerned about is God's perspective of us instead of man's title of what a virgin is. Because we'll try and go through loopholes. Do you understand? So the thing is, well, it didn't really go in. You know, come on. So what, we're, we're not trying to do that. Oh, we real, you know. All right, so we, it's not really about trying to get to the detail, but it is about if do, are we supposed to be, the word says, circumcised in our heart. Does that make sense? And when a child is circumcised, they are that mark of circumcision, it, it separates, it creates that covenant. So honestly, no. Um, if we look at just definition of loan, if you're doing oral sex and all those things, please don't think that you could just boldly proclaim your virginity because you're doing things that don't have to do with penetration. But that shouldn't be our goal. God, I want to be pure in your, in your sight. I want you to know the inward part of me. Because honestly, even if we didn't do oral sex, anal sex, whatever sex, 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 we could still be perverse in our mind and not touch a person. And that's why God brings that out. And he says that if you look on a woman, it's like adultery. Amen? Amen. So let us be pure in the inward most parts. Amen? Amen. 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 
this is a beautiful this was a beautiful session and we just don't want to you know end like this we want to do just an altar call for anyone that is really asking God for deliverance for strength in the area of you know sexual purity sexual immorality and you really want the Lord to really you know deliver you set you free those things we just want you to come up you know boldly you know and we're just going I'm just going to pray forgotten we are not looked as trashed before the eyes of our father he has forgiven us he says that those who believe in Jesus Christ are not condemned and Lord God I thank you for your word oh God for saying that we are holy thank you for calling us holy we don't have to walk out holiness we don't have to do things to be holy you have already called us to be holy so God I thank you for causing everyone here that is at the altar to be holy I think that you have called them holy you have called them holy they are holy they are holy oh God because they have received you as their Lord and their Savior because they know you oh God so because of that they will walk out of holiness because it is who they are Lord we are holy so we will walk in holiness we are holy not because of the things we do but it's because of who we are it's now our nature so God I begin to break every yoke of sexual impurity in the name of Jesus I begin to break every yoke every bondage of sexual immorality every bondage of masturbation every bondage of pornography I call it off of your children in the name of Jesus I call them holy I call them pure in the name of Jesus I thank you all God, that you have set them free God, your word says, oh God, that whoever you set free is free indeed. So I call your children free in the name of Jesus. I call them delivered from the captivity, from the bondage of sexual immorality in the name of Jesus. I release freedom to walk in holiness, freedom to walk in purity, freedom, oh God, to walk, oh God, in the newness of life, oh God, not being held in captivity, not being ashamed in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for complete deliverance. So God, and even as they have, even as they have walked out here, Jesus, so God, with open hearts, with open arms, oh God, asking for your help, oh God, asking for your strength, oh God, Lord, we thank you that your strength is upon them, oh God, to say no to ungodliness in the name of Jesus, but to say yes to righteousness. There will be instruments of righteousness for your own use, oh God. We give you glory, oh God, for your children. Thank you for deliverance, oh God. Thank you for freedom in the name of Jesus. They will not be the same in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we just worship you. We give you all the praise. Hallelujah. You can go back to your seats. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen.
Amen. This is great. I think we need to dedicate a whole um, weekend to this topic so we can actually look at scriptures in details. But we are not able to do that. The one thing that has come to our notice is that people are really, really in personal needs. This pulpit, we can't meet your need from this pulpit. There are some people that have personal needs and we have created a forum for you to be prayed for at any time you are free. And to seek cancer, everything is not just prayer. We need to talk to you personally to find your ans to answers to your, to your questions. So we have a prayer room that is behind here. Um, some counselors are going to be there. On this issue of uh, uh, perversion and sexual immorality, um, uh, Minister Nikki and Mat Matez will be at the back also. That room is big, so we can take corners and handle it. So if you want have questions, don't want everybody going there to line up one by one. You can go there and write your name, and they can send you a text to when to come. You know, um, if you want to be there and get there, and there are many people, just give your name, and they can call you or text you and tell you when it's time to come. And uh, you all are, you know can join if you have the time. So that's it. And plus other issues other than sex, sexual immorality. If you have other issues, condemnation in your heart, depression. You have questions that nobody is answering you know please feel free don't go back from this conference the way you came because god is here to deliver you amen having said that it's um, eight at 8 40 we have five minutes but uh, sorry did i say 8 40 at, at 3 40 we are going to have the roundup session for all the seminars so i expect all the leaders if you let a panel if you let a panel the panelists can go down now. Just the person that led the panel will stay up here. To, and there are other leaders from other workshops. Please come up here to stay and, and, and give a summary of the, of the content of your workshop. So there were four workshops that happened. That's the program. The program. The leader of each workshop should come up here, please. Eh? The, uh, of this workshop. All, all the workshops that happen, the, the leader, the leader of the panel, the, head, the person that led that panel should come up here. Okay, you want to? Is Bruce here? <laughs> they say, are you saying he should represent? Okay, pastor says you should represent your workshop. Okay, this is for leadership. This is for mentoring and post movement. Call it mentoring. <laughs> and then this is for holiness in his step. Praise the Lord. Um, and this is for courtship, right? So, all we want to do is you have 20, uh, we have 20 minutes total, and that's like five, five minutes to give a summary of what happened in your workshop. And I think we can start from here. Hallelujah. We talked about leadership, and we talked about what distinguishes the biblical leadership. The fact that those we see in God's word, regardless of the sphere of leadership, whether they were kings, prophets, whether it was spiritual or administrative, what distinguishes those that were exemplary is that the presence of God was with them, including our Lord, the fact that he, had, he was the Lord, he had the spirit of God. And we talked about how important it is to draw the line of resistance against temptation and sin far from the edge and specific characteristics of those who are welcoming the presence of God into their lives. The fact that you need to commune with God daily, that shows your dependence on him. The fact that you need to surround yourself with godly friends, your intimate friends should be people who are seeking after God, people who have the fear of the Lord. We talked about the fact that they also, you also need to be someone who's, who has a teachable spirit. You're willing to listen to correction. No matter how highly placed you are in leadership, no matter how old you get, you need to always have a teachable spirit if you are going to be someone characterized by the presence of God. And the fact that those people are also people who guard their hearts with all diligence. 
and there are people who acknowledge that the wisdom, the gift, the anointing, whatever it is that they have, it comes from God. It's not yours. You're just the donkey. And the fact that um, there are people who also they make sure that the lives they live, they cause people around them to praise God. They live transparent lives. All right? Thank you. Praise the Lord. So we um, had the seminar for Pulse Movement, which is BCF's mentoring program that is starting right after the conference ends. It's a six-month intensive um, training program where you are led by team captains and you are being mentored and you are actually growing in Christ. And so we were able to talk about how this program is for real and it's not a fluffy thing. It's people are actually really dedicating their time to growing in the Lord, to coming together and becoming transparent and accountable to each other so that they can go to the next level. We also spoke a lot about um, our core values and what the, the tone, the tone that we set in Pulse Movement is one of love, one of honor, one of openness, one that we are seeking the Lord wholeheartedly. In Pulse Movement, every month there's a different project or theme. So we have the first month where you build your core values around who are you, who are you gonna be, what are you gonna base your life on. We also have walking in righteousness, walking in the spirit. At the end, we have like a big camp where we all come together and we just have fun and grow more as a family. So Pulse Movement is for any and everyone, especially new converts. We don't want you to just leave this conference and fall off, but you, we want you to be, become a part of a tight-knit community. And you'll find that also in um, BCF's Pulse Movement, the mentoring program. So we're gonna have a table in the back and um, you can come see myself, Shell, Lumide, Lulu, Shola, Abib, there's a lot of us, and you could just come sign up. It's limited to 120 people, so the first 120 people that sign up are the first people that get to be a part of the six months, and I got to be a part of Pulse Movement, and I've been a part of it for the past three months, and it has transformed my life, and so please join, it's gonna be awesome. Right, good afternoon. Um, I was part of the uh, Courtship in His Steps uh, panel, and we had an awesome time in the back, did we not? We did. And uh, we covered an array of topics. We covered um, uh, so many things having to do with relationships and courtships. One of the main things that, um, that we spent time talking about was accountability, and uh, the difference between uh, just kind of a, a fly-by-night, I chose you, you chose me, dating type of situation to courtship. And one of the main, one of the key characteristics that separates the two is accountability. And we talked about how important it is for your spiritual leaders to be uh, aware of your relationships, uh, parents to be aware of your relationships, uh, so that there can be proper uh, counseling and mentoring and, uh, and prayer in that relationship. So many people, uh, what we found out, may have thought that they were in a courtship but are really not, um, because without accountability, it's not a courtship. Uh, so we talked about that. Um, we talked about some practical ways, if you are in a courtship, to, um, to remain pure sexually. Uh, we shared, my wife and I shared um, some things that we had been doing up until three weeks ago when we got married, uh, right out of her cell phone, you know, things that we had put together, a battle plan to say, okay, we're gonna please God, and we're going to keep this relationship pure and holy. So um, those are some of the things that we covered, and we're definitely still available uh, for questions if you have some. And um, God bless you. Hello, uh, Nikki and myself, as well as our uh, panelists, uh, led the discussion on holiness, overcoming sexual immorality, slash perversion. Um, we talked about a lot of stuff, had some great questions. Um, one of the key things that we highlighted was that um, holiness is not just about sexual immorality, but holiness is the position that we have in Christ Jesus. 
and we now live out that holiness because it's our new nature. It's who, how we've been recreated or born again in Christ Jesus. Um, so it's not just about sexual immorality. The goal, um, as far as being pure, is not about abstaining from sex or being a virgin. The goal is to glorify God in all of our ways and in all of our thoughts and in our heart. Um, because God looks upon the heart of man, not just on his outward deeds. Um, we also talked about confession, how important confession is and, and being open and honest and uh, accountability and talking to people and not um, hiding our sins, but you know, having people who will hold us to that standard, having people that we can call or that we know will call us and check on us and see where we are. These are practical things that we can do to help us um, walk out this holiness and continue to walk um, uh, live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Um, I'm trying to think. We talked about so many different things. <laughs> um, you want to add anything? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so since we still have a couple minutes, we want to just take a um, few questions from you guys. If you have any questions that you would like to ask the panelists, this would be the right time to do so. Oh, okay. So it's for high school, college, alumni, graduates. We welcome everyone. honest because people keep laughing um like what if you just really like to dance sexually like what do you like how do you stop like is it like generational is it like because I'm just African is it yeah like I feel like like I mean like I've tried like I've tried like the you know secular music fast and stuff like that or just not listening to secular music whatever but it's like my body always urges to just dance sexually Well, I was going to say, because I used to dance, um, you know, minus a few pounds ago. You know what I'm saying? I still can get down, wrestling. But I'm just saying, I used to dance, and I was on a dance line, and I was even a part of a, um, I went to Florida a and before I went to Valdosta State, and I used to be a part of this little dance group, and we were seriously nasty, you know. And so, once, once um, the Lord began to purify my heart, um, one of the things I would even find myself doing, we would be in church, and, um, I would be worshiping the Lord, you know, and I just feel it, you know, I'd be like, uh, you know, and then I was like, hold on, wait for a minute. <laughs> and I will never forget, it was a brother in Christ that tapped me on my, he was like, what are you doing? And I was just like, nothing. And he was like, I know I was in a store, and the music came on, and I was just, you know, and I was like, I danced before the Lord. And he was like, wait, you got to think about, one, the word talks about how our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, amen? And we have to realize, again, in Romans I say this all the time, that he says, present your body as a living sacrifice. My body is, we, we think more about our preferences, our preferences more than what God prefers. And we have to esteem him beyond our personality, beyond what we like, beyond what we used to do. And we have to even remind ourselves that that was the old way of thinking. Like there is a new you that is awaiting. You just have to pay, you have to begin to examine that and not say a lot of times as believers we'll say, well, you know, I just like doing this and this is me. But you gotta remember I'm crucified with Christ. I, I don't live anymore. And so it, does that mean immediately I don't have this right way of thinking? I mean, I have this right way? No, you have to have a renewed mind and that renewed mind begins to affect even the way you dance. It, you will begin to look at the way you dance and say, you know what, I don't want to um, turn on anybody. I don't, because you have to think about those motives. Most of the time when we move the way we do, we're trying to pull something, girl. You know, we're trying to get some attention. And what that says, another thing that it says, 
underneath is that there is another desire that is missing. We are lacking the attention. We are lacking God. Allow the core of me to be pure in the utmost part. Does that make sense? And when we as dancers and musicians, we know when our core is corrupt, our performance is corrupt. Amen? So really what you need to begin to examine is that heart issue about what is it that I really desire and coming from me. Um, we're not going to take all questions uh, because we have very few minutes. But Daniel has a question. Daniel? Hello? Oh, okay. So I've been wondering this for the longest time. Um, according to the knowledge that you guys have biblically, um, how do you feel, or if it says anything in the Bible about interfaith relationships, like say if um, I were to date a Muslim and I'm Christian, but in my heart that I feel that I love this person, I'm in love with this person, like it feels right, but we have different views in faith. Um, I want, I want to say that a lot of the questions that, that you guys are asking and that will come out and even questions just as you, uh, progress in faith come as you, as, uh, Nikki was saying, renew your mind. And so yesterday, even when I talked about repentance, we talked about repentance being more than asking forgiveness. You're asking forgiveness. You're announcing your new position but then you're also starting a process of renewing your mind. A believer who is progressive, progressively renewing their mind to the word of God will realize that that relationship will never work because you're standing on two different foundations. And, and only, the only way to really live this life for real in a way that's pleasing to God is for your foundation to be the word of the living God. And if you're walking with somebody, the Bible says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? So somewhere there's going to be serious disagreement. And if there's not serious disagreement, that means somebody's compromising in their walk. So I would definitely advise you, absolutely not. W what are some scriptures? How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 gives an outline of what the family is supposed to be and how the husband is supposed to love the wife. Uh, uh, just like Christ loves the church. And uh, if you're talking about a Muslim relationship, that you know, that's, that's all the way. So it, what it is, is it, it means you've got to, and I'm glad you asked the question, because some people may be wondering that and didn't ask. The more you spend time in the Word of God, the more you ask those types of questions, the more you grow, you will see. But I promise you, don't even get it started, because it will not work. Praise God. Okay, so how do you practically help somebody out of um, sexual immor immorality? Somebody is suffering from, let's say, masturbation, pornography, and all those stuff, and then you want to help that person out. So I want us to, I know we've talked about handling it personally, but how do we practically help somebody out of it? Thank you. First, first thing I would say that um, we don't rely on our own knowledge, on our own experiences. Um, the one, one mistake that we often make is that we tell people, well, you know, I, we, we get eager when we hear somebody ask a question about something we can relate to. I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. Um, I've counseled a lot of people concerning sexual immorality and pornography and things like that, and I'm, I'm a, I get eager sometimes to answer a question, oh, yeah, I know that one, man, because I did that, and I da 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 and one thing the Lord is teaching me is like, be slow to speak and be quick to hear. Be slow to speak and quick to hear. Um, be quick to hear the Lord. Pray for direction. Also, be a good listener to the other person. Um, if you're listening to the Lord and you're listening to that person, a lot of times you'll realize the issue is not really with the sexual sin. The issue is something much deeper um, and you'll, you'll listen, sometimes if you listen long enough, you'll realize, okay, this is something beyond me, and I need to go to an authority, 
I need to go to someone who, who is an elder and I need, to, I need to have them talk to them about this issue because we're just dealing with branches here and there's some, there's some roots that need to be dug up. You understand what I'm saying? So um, first, the first thing I say, humility. Humility, anytime you're helping someone, you, you come in humility, you come as a servant submitted to the Lord and de desiring to help that person, not to show off, or and, and, and it's not even necessarily showing off, but it's not for us to take this position as if we're an authority and we know all the answers, okay? Um, other things that I would suggest, um, listening to the person, directing them to an authority or, or to an elder, but also, giving them the resources like we've given you guys, the same way that I, I got books up here that I, I still read today. I still read this book um, called Divine Design for Discipleship, and I tell everybody that this is a great book. Get this book. Take this resource. We tell everybody about settingcaptivesfree.com because it's a great resource. So we equip people and give them resources that they can use even in the absence of me because what you don't want is people to become dependent on you for their freedom. You're not their Jesus, okay? We, we can't replace the Holy Spirit in a person's life. We can give them resources. We can be a good listener. Um, we are the body of Christ, but at the same time, they have to develop a personal faith and go to the Lord and, and, and see him work it out personally in their life. So that's uh, some things I would suggest. Name of the book, Divine Design for Discipleship by Pastor Chad Craig. Divine Design for Discipleship. Um, I don't know the website for it. If you Google it, it'll come up. It's sold in bookstores. It's sold online. The website, oh, settingcaptivesfree.com. Settingcaptivesfree.com. And it, it covers all, I mean, it covers a lot of addictions, not just sexual addictions. Thank you. Um, I just have a, one scripture for the young lady that asked the question before this one. Um, is in Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. From verse 14, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Um, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is, it, is there between the temple of God and idols? So the Bible just, you know, clearly states that Believers, we do not really have anything in common with unbelievers. Um, so when you're seeking for a partner, your partner has to be a believer. Amen. Um, one more question. Just one. Oh, the, there's a line over there. Yeah. Just one more question. One, yeah, just one question. Thank you, guys. Okay. So... Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, um, this question is about leadership. And I want to know what is the struggles, what is the struggles in ministry leadership? Because we are starting um, a ministry on campus and it's, it's, it's the new beginning is very hard that it drains you and you want to just stop. But you love the Lord so much and you, you are holding on to his vision. So uh, what are the struggles in ministry and how can one overcome it? Oh, the strategies, yeah. Struggles, right? The struggles or the strategies Str in overcoming, like, like, I don't know how yeah, to put I it. <laughs> I wanted to be sure I was clear on the word. You're, you're saying struggles, right? Yeah, struggles. In, struggles okay. you will come by in ministry, um, Christian ministry, yeah, ministry. Yeah, okay. As a leader. One of the struggles you'll come through is something you mentioned already, keeping at it even when there's no obvious encouragement to just keep at the truth you know, especially when there's a lot of error around and where those who are peddling falsehood under the guise of Christianity, when they seem to be prospering and you are sticking to what is true and right and biblical and it seems there's just no obvious encouragement, keeping at it, that's one of the struggles. But you remember who our master, what our master, who our master is. Remember when he died on the cross, it look, looked like everything was lost. And he only worked with 12 disciples. I'm talking about the core. He also had the 120. He had a lot of people. But there was just this core of 12. And it was after the, res the resurrection. 
and the 12, after they got filled with the Holy Spirit, that they went abroad. The other thing I want to mention is you leave the outcome to Christ because it may be decades away. I was telling someone that Agosia's dad was my Sunday school teacher, and there were a lot of our, that's um, Dr. Fowley, was my Sunday school teacher, and there were a lot of my colleagues who didn't surrender to Christ like we did when we were in um, secondary school and junior high. But decades, I'm talking about decades down the line, they're finding Uncle Innocent, that's what we call our God is dead with, they're finding him on Facebook and sending a letter to him that, I'm now born again, I now know the Lord, and I remember, I remember the seeds you sowed. So keeping at it is one. The other thing is just being real, being transparent. I love this couple because they are so real. They are so real. They're, tra they're, they're transparent. There's no putting airs about me. And as people get older, as you spend longer in ministry, you'll find people, they want to carry your Bible to the stage. And like, this great man and great woman of God. And it can get to your head. You have to put the boundaries that, look, no, I am human. I can fall. I'm, no, I am not anything. I'm the donkey, okay? You know what I mean? When I keep saying the donkey, I mean, Jesus rode on a donkey, right, into Jerusalem, and the children, Hosanna, and people were spreading their clothes on the floor, and the donkey was trampling, and the donkey could easily get it in his head. It's me they're calling Hosanna. I'm, I'm the cool one. No, it's Jesus riding the donkey. So it's the Spirit of God on the inside that makes us anything. What do we have that we didn't receive? Nothing. So being transparent, being real, and being accountable, no matter how high you go, and by God's grace, God is going to take you beyond your imagination. No matter where God takes you, you make yourself accountable to people that you know that they are walking with God. So those are, those are the immediate ones that come to my mind. I don't know if... Thank you, Dr. Banjo. Um, can we give it up for the panelists, please? Woo! So we're going to move into the more, ex I mean, everything has been exciting so far, but we're going to do something different. Um, we're going to move into going to move into open mics, skits, testimonies, special numbers, and this is going to be handled by Uncle Nee. <laughs> oh, yes. And um, one more announcement. Ministers Nikki and her husband are going to be... <laughs> are going to be in the prayer room. So if anyone needs more prayer um, concerning, you know, any issue that you're dealing with or that you still need prayer for, they'll be in the prayer room. So the prayer room is open. You can go there and they'll pray for you. Amen. Um, the prayer room is 2A, um, that way. To your right, my left. Amen. Have you been blessed tonight? If you've been blessed, give God a shout of praise right now. If you have been blessed by God, give God a shout of praise. I know, I know some, some, some of you are feeling tired, but let's, let's put the devil to shame. Let's put the devil to shame. We're almost there. We're almost there. If you have been blessed and you know that God has given you a renewed strength, a new freedom, Please get up and give God a shot of praise. Come on, let's just rise, let's rise, let's rise. Let's just say, God, I surrender all to you. Just say that, just say that prayer right now. Just say, God, I surrender all to you. Just sing this. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great 
is our God. Oh, sing how great, how great is our God. Sing that song. How great, how great is our God. Is our God. Sing with me. Just raise your hand and sing the song. Say how great, how great is our God. Sing with me. Is our God. How great, how great is our God. Just raise your hands and raise your voice. Say how great. thank you because you're a great God. We thank you because you're a mighty God. You've given us an opportunity, oh God, to experience you, oh God, and have an encounter with you. We just want to take a moment and say that you are so great. You know? Your name is above every name, Father. Thank you for the release. Thank you for the freedom that we have in you, Father. And we just say, have your way, oh God. Continue, oh God, to speak to us and guide us, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord. We give you all glory. We give all honor, we give all adoration, for we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Now give God a thunderous clap offering right now. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're going to take a quick moment just to just see and learn from all the people that God has given talents and gifts to express. So tonight... Or is this to this evening, actually? It's just a time to just see what people have and what God has given to us. And God said that we should not, what, bury our talents, but also invest in it. So this is a big opportunity to do that. Um, we just specifically had specific people that had. Go ahead and sit down, sit down, sit down. Tonight is just a quick, we're going to spend some time. We're going to have some spoken word. We're going to have some dance. We're going to have some ministration. Amen. Amen? Hallelujah. So for those that I've spoken to, the first person, just come to the side. Her name, Angela. Angela. Amen. Just get excited because at the end, we'll be getting ready to take a wonderful group picture uh, just to end this session. But as Angela comes up, um, as she begins to um, 
minister to us. And Angela is going to be doing a song. So introduce yourself of what school you're from. Hi, my name is Angela, and I'm from Morgan State University. <laughs> and I'll be doing a song called He Wants It All because God wants our all. He doesn't want 90%, 50 He wants 100%. So hope you're blessed. Hallelujah, we worship you, God. There's a voice that cries out in the silence, searching for a heart that will love him, and longing for a child that will give him that. Child that will give 